Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Andrew Samlick, and I am a professor in and chair of the Department of Economics here at Dartmouth. We're pleased to co-sponsor this evening's Rockefeller Center event, Police Force Size and Civilian Race, pre presented by Professor Morgan C. Williams, Jr. of Barnard College at Columbia University. If I may, I'd like to frame our discussion today with two tragedies that illustrate, if imperfectly, what is at stake. We are two years and one day since the brutal and inhumane murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis by a police officer. Mr. Floyd was in police custody in the aftermath of being suspected for passing a counterfeit $20 bill. His race and his murder prompted a range of responses, including movements to, quote, defund the police. We are two days from yet another mass shooting, this time at an, an elementary school in Uvalde, Texas, a town that is 80% Hispanic or Latino with a per capita income that is just over half the national average. 19 children and two adults were murdered and several more were injured. While details are still emerging and being confirmed, we do know that there was a police presence at the school when the gunman arrived and a mobilization of other law enforcement personnel that eventually ended the violence. We acknowledge that a police presence is sadly essential in some aspects of our society. The deployment and rules of engagement for police officers are matters of vital policy relevance. How would any community know that it had the right answers to these policy questions? I guess it could learn by doing, slowly, or it could seek out the knowledge and wisdom from society at large. Making sure that the benefits of, of, the benefits of knowledge accrue broadly to society is a fundamental purpose of a university. Social scientists have a role to play in achieving that purpose. We can gather data, we can make comparisons, draw reasonable conclusions, disseminate these findings, and critically facilitate their translation into socially beneficial outcomes. Our guest this evening, Professor Williams, is an expert in using both applied, empirical, and theoretical techniques to examine the economic consequences of crime and incarceration policy for racial inequality in the United States. Importantly, his research agenda includes policing reform. Today, he will discuss his research on the race-specific effects of larger police forces in the United States. His results speak to aspects of both the low-level offenses and the violent crimes alluded to earlier. In particular, he finds empirical support for what is an all-too-common narrative that black communities are simultaneously over and under-policed. Professor Williams' research has been published in journals such as the American Economic Review Insights, in addition to enjoying support from the Russell Sage Foundation and the Robert Wood Johnson Policies for Action Initiative. He is an affiliate at the Columbia University Population Research Center. Prior to joining the faculty at Barnard College, Professor Williams completed the New York University Provost's postdoctoral fellowship through the Robert F. Wagner Graduate School of Public Service. He received his PhD in economics from the City University of New York Graduate Center, his MPH from the Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health, and his BA from Morehouse College. Before calling Professor Williams to the podium, I'd like to note that the question and answer portion of today's event will be moderated by Dr. Herschel Knockless, who is a research assistant professor of government at Dartmouth and a policy fellow at the Rockefeller Center. Professor Knockless studies and teaches American politics, law, and public policy, focusing on health policy, regulation, and political institutions. As today's event is being live streamed, I would like to remind everyone that questions can be submitted by emailing them to rockyqna at dartmouth.edu. With that bit of housekeeping out of the way, I would like to ask that you join me in welcoming Professor Morgan Williams. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, many thanks to, to Dartmouth, to the Economics Department, to the Rocky, uh, and you certainly in inviting me out and. Uh, your willingness to kind of entertain me on such a beautiful day um, is going to be greatly appreciated uh, from this point of view. Uh, I would be remiss as well if I did not say just how just you know heartbroken 
tragic loss of life that just took place in Texas. Just, you know, uh, it just only mention, uh, if you are kind of, you know, going pa a little past the anniversary of the tragic murder of George Floyd, uh, one thing that's also interesting is the fact that uh, just a day or so ago, uh, we just uh, saw President Biden actually sign off on an executive order uh, that will, at least, at least just from the federal point of view, uh, some aspects of policing reform, right? Things that we're interested in. So we can only hope uh, that many of those same sorts of initiatives are on the horizon, despite how frustrating it might be uh, in terms of kind of larger uh, policy uh, interests when it comes down to gun control. So I'm gonna talk a little bit today about uh, some work that I've done uh, in co-authorship with my brilliant, uh, brilliant colleagues, uh, Aaron Chalfin, uh, Benjamin Hansen, and Emily Weisburst, in, in which we kind of take a very intensive look at the impact of expanding police forces within the United States and you know, perhaps the idea uh, that these differences might exist, or at least differences might exist in terms of the public safety returns across racial groups. So I don't think it's any secret to anyone that's paid attention to the news or social media uh, over the past year or years uh, that our faith in policing, at least as we surveyed it, has been declining uh, as a society. Uh, and you know, one thing that's kind of of interest is the fact that, well, kind of dating back to about 2014, 2015 or so, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement has had a very prominent role in kind of redefining our attention with respect to exactly what do we want from policing, what don't we want from policing, and it's an absolute just pleasure to have had that experience through them uh, and being able to shape this larger discourse that's very much necessary and is relevant to many other movements before. There's also been just discussions about exactly sh how should we prioritize policing in terms of our approach to public safety. And the defund movement has been one of those initiatives uh, that has taken place over the past year or so. And asking some very, very important questions about exactly how should we kind of define the scope of policing? Uh, are there any sort of viable alternatives to policing that we should entertain? Uh, in this instance, I, I also feel as if we've kind of gained a tremendous amount uh, from that sort of uh, discourse and has actually led to meaningful uh, reforms that have taken place in many cities throughout the country. However, uh, over the past year or so, we've also seen an increase in this kind of post-pandemic violence, if you will, uh, in certain major American cities throughout the country. Uh, that has certainly added a new wrinkle uh, to exactly how we should be or should not be going about pursuing some of these reforms. Uh, and it's also placed some pressure on maybe some of our policymakers, DAs, police departments, et cetera, that have very much enthusiastically embraced uh, the idea of kind of bringing in more progressive reforms and approaching public safety, uh, while at the same time trying, trying to maintain public safety, especially for most, many of the vulnerable communities that exist throughout our country. Uh, one thing that is clear and something that I do want to note uh, is that there seems to be a good bit of evidence uh, that has come about from economics, from criminology, and other aspects of the, of the social sciences that seems to point uh, to the importance of police employment to reducing crime. And in that way, I mean, the, one of the fascinating things to me is the fact that many of these studies taking slightly different approaches to getting to that same question actually have some fairly harmonious things to say about the impact of police through employment uh, on many different sorts of criminal offenses uh, I've obviously benefited a great deal, and this paper benefits a great deal from the Evans and Owens 2007 paper, uh, Chalfin McCrary, obviously Professor Mello's work. Uh, these are things that have certainly kind of informed and inspired this paper, and so we want to kind of, we want to see ourselves as kind of building uh, off of this very nice literature. Uh, there's also been some work, which we won't obviously talk about through the study that at least I'm going to discuss today, that's also suggested that maybe the police, through their visibility, uh, also have some, you know, very important effects uh, on crime, whether it be through kind of the reallocation of policing resources uh, due to a terrorist attack or, or some other sort of kind of hotspot policing approach. Each of these sorts of uh, you know, very important policy levers uh, also seem to just kind of point to, again, the idea that uh, police, whether it's through their visibility or through their numbers, can have an important effect on crime. However, one of the things that I like to often say is that I am very much uh, you know, a scholar of race and I'm economist second and many other things third. And a question that I often try to kind of interrogate a little bit is just the idea of how race is important to certain sorts of economic behavior, but especially uh, as it pertains to inequality within crime and criminal justice in the United States. And so a natural question that we all kind of had in kind of carrying out this study uh, was the idea is that, well, we know that there seem to be some benefits, right? Among other things, but some benefits 
uh, as it pertains to, you know, kind of expanding the size of the police force uh, for, you know, public safety improvement. Uh, but do these things necessarily look the same when we kind of look across black and white communities throughout the United States? And so that's kind of be like the kind of central kind of motivating uh, point here. And I think there's some reasons that we should kind of think that this might indeed be the case. So I'll kind of start off with just the idea that say, you know, there are many different theories, again, going through sociology and elsewhere, just in this particular point, I'm kind of leaning on some of the work of Rob Sampson and uh, uh, William Julius Wilson and others that have kind of suggested that, hey, maybe some of the kind of macro social patterns that we see uh, in uh, criminal behavior, and at least in uh, laws across racial groups, can be kind of you know, chopped up to you know, maybe differences in institutions, norms, things that kind of build up within the community settings in ways that might differ across black and white communities. There's also the idea that vice market competition could you know, necessarily kind of lead to different impacts across racial groups. Uh, there's a very nice uh, paper from Dan O'Flaherty and Rajiv Seti, uh, two of my colleagues, that suggests that, hey, you know, there's some important trade-offs between uh, you know, conducting these sorts of vice operations, especially when it comes down to drug transactions uh, in the city versus the suburbs. Uh, if there's some sort of, you know, kind of competitive advantage in terms of numbers or visibility within the city uh, compared to the suburbs, then maybe uh, we can explain some of the racial differences or patterns uh, that might exist in vice market activity. Uh, to the extent that we're able to kind of dismantle uh, illicit markets through, say, you know, some sort of police employment change or other policing endeavors, uh, this could necessarily lead to a, an, maybe a, perhaps a reduction in black homicide in many of these same communities. Finally, uh, there's another idea that, you know, hey, maybe some of the public safety improvements could differ across black and white communities in the sense that, well, uh, generally speaking, we're going to prioritize the redeploy deployment or redeployment of policing resources to neighborhoods that have high crime. And to the extent that black Americans are living within uh, many communities that are traditionally, historically uh, experiencing higher levels of victimization or crime, we might expect many of the additional resources that might come about from, you know, well, hiring more police officers to perhaps, you know, disproportionately benefit some of these communities versus others. So these are some of the reasons why we might believe uh, that some of the public safety benefits, so to speak, uh, could differ across black and white communities. But there are also uh, many costs that could come about from kind of kind of uh, leveraging a very similar sort of strategy. So uh, some things that we might want to point to is the fact that, well, hotspot policing, it might increase or it might improve public safety. Uh, but at the same time, it might kind of lead to some sort of deterioration in the views of the community members whose neighborhoods are being saturated with a police presence. Uh, that's something, that, a very important cost that we need to be able to account for. There's also the idea that community cooperation, especially in the presence of police Ill illegitimacy or perceived police, Ill police illegitimacy, uh, that can make it much harder uh, to kind of work in tandem with community members. This is especially important when we're going to do things like reduce homicide victimization, because those sorts of things necessarily require uh, community members to be, you know, say, uh, you know, witness experts or, you know, to be able to come in and say, hey, you know, I saw this and I want to get, share this type of information. To the extent that we believe that police departments are not acting in our best interest, that's going to be a much harder endeavor, which will ultimately lower the cost of kind of murdering with impunity uh, when in many of the same neighborhoods that we're hoping to improve the conditions for. Finally, or let's I have two more, but another kind of I, you know, idea is that perhaps you know, when we kind of saturate a community uh, with a high police presence, uh, that there might necessarily be disproportionate exposure to the criminal justice system as a result. So you could kind of think about, say, New York, the New York City's uh, Stop Question and Frisk program uh, in its very man various manifestations as kind of one such policy that many argue has led to many more black New Yorkers and Hispanic New Yorkers unnecessarily kind of entering into the criminal justice system. Finally, we won't talk about this today, but uh, one of the things that we clearly want to talk about and is on everybody's minds is the idea that perhaps as an additional cost, any time a police officer comes into contact with a civilian, there's an opportunity for a use of force event. And with that use of force event, uh, we might be worried uh, that to the extent that black communities are kind of quote unquote over-policed, uh, then maybe they also might be, uh, have a differential exposure uh, to uh, use of force incidents. That's kind of a much more of an open question uh, within the kind of economics of crime uh, part of the literature. So these are certain you know, benefits and costs that we might believe are important to consider when kind of thinking about whether or not uh, we should kind of pursue uh, police force expansion. So in this particular study, we're going to seek to do a couple of different things. So the first thing we want to do is that we want to kind of assess the extent to which kind of hiring one additional officer is ultimately going to improve uh, police sa public safety. But in particular, we're going to focus on homicide victimization 
And we're going to focus most, most importantly in this particular context on non-Hispanic black and white Americans. The reason being is uh, much of the data seems to be a bit better in terms of identifying these different kind of racial slash ethnic groups uh, and ways in which we're able to consistently do so over the course of our study, generally focusing on the 1980 to 2018 period, depending on which of, your, of the empirical strategies that we're kind of entertaining. And just to be clear, we're going to focus on kind of these uh, you know, non-justifiable, if you will, homicides or non-kind of official homicides uh, that take place beyond the civilian scope. So these will be civilian on civilian homicides. Second, we're also going to kind of take a look at enforcement activity. So we want to know what exactly happens when a police force expands in terms of the types of arrests that they make. Uh, one way of kind of looking at this, and of course we're going to look across racial groups, you know, because that's kind of one of our primary questions here, is going to be, well, we want to first take a look at index arrests. Index arrests uh, kind of, you know, basically, or index crimes are kind of basically some of these very, very serious crimes uh, that uh, we want to be able to track and account for. Things like rape, robbery, murder, uh, grand larceny, et cetera. So we'll look at index arrests across racial groups, but as a benchmark, we'll look at index crimes overall because those, those are the data that we have access to. We'll also take a look at the quote unquote quality of life arrest or you know, offenses that are associated with those arrests in which uh, generally speaking, they're characterized as misdemeanors, uh, usually are kind of more so punished by fines than they are kind of you know, extensive kind of uh, prison sentences or jail sentences. And so uh, it's usually kind of hard to kind of pinpoint uh, a victim in this case, but you could think of things like uh, you know, drug possession, you can think of disorderly conduct or liquor law violations as things to keep in mind when you're kind of thinking about some of these quality of life offenses. Finally, we're also not going to say much on clearance rates because quite frankly we don't find much on clearance rates. Uh, but again, you know, this is something that we just want to be able to account for given its importance to this space of the literature. So some of the contributions. So one of the things that we're able to kind of do uh, within this particular study is that we're going to actually account for you know, certain sorts of kind of municipal budgetary items. And, and in that way, we can at least, you know, in doing that, we can account for the historical opportunity cost of investing an additional dollar of public funds in, in one officer uh, versus kind of allocating those funds to somewhere else. So we're going to hold a lot of other stuff constant, but uh, in controlling for, you know, say, you know, tax revenues or other things that we want to account for at the municipal level, uh, we're able to kind of uh, provide some important insight about this historical trade-off within the data. We're also going to kind of add a kind of new race perspective that we believe is an important consideration uh, within talking about improvements in public safety. Black Americans account for about 13% of the population, but about 50% of the homicides. So there's a great stake here when you're kind of thinking about you know, how important these interventions are or policies are in terms of their impact of, on black and white communities throughout the country. Uh, certainly, we can point to some additional work that's been done by John Donahue and Steve Levitt and uh, also Justin McCurry's work on affirmative action and how it's kind of changed police departments. It's also a very nice paper uh, that we believe kind of speaks to some of the important race effects that exist. Not an exhaustive list of studies, but some that we just kind of note here. Finally, uh, something that's of interest to us that will kind of just give you kind of a, you know, a prelude to is just the idea that uh, it seems as if deterrence can be an important mechanism for kind of improving public safety. And if that's going to be the case, and as I'll kind of show you uh, through some of the results, it seems as if there potentially could be a double dividend in the sense that we can both improve public safety uh, you know, through, say, an expansion of the police force uh, while also not necessarily bringing people in to the criminal justice system in disproportionate ways. Um, so these are kind of some interesting kind of things that are kind of on our mind. And uh, one of the other things that I will say is just that you know, there's probably a larger conversation to be had. This is kind of one narrow accounting of how we should kind of think about the impact of police force expansion on criminal behavior or enforcement activity. Uh, but there's probably a larger conversation that needs to take place in terms of how the community perceives their public safety needs and how policymakers perceive their public safety needs and how we can kind of bridge the gap of understanding. So I always kind of, you know, in kind of being told that you know, you're having a diverse audience, they always say, you know, well, you can leave out the equations. Then what happens, you go out to dinner and somebody says, why did you leave out the equations? So in order to save my own self, I'm going to leave in the equations and we'll just talk just a little bit exactly about what we're doing here. So just to say for anybody that's taking metrics, we're, trying to, we're interested in just answering a simple question. What happens if we regress, say, uh, homicides uh, on uh, some sort of measure, point in time measure of police employment? Uh, we lag it in order to be able to account for just the contemporaneous versus non-contemporaneous differences in terms of how these things might affect one another. Uh, but we're going to kind of run, we want to run a simple regression. And anybody that can, is kind of seeing this sort of regression will tell you that you probably have a number of different concerns, right, in terms of endogeneity. So, uh, and this is certainly true in the literature. One of the things that you might be worried about 
uh, is what's, you know, which arrow does the calls, which way does the causal arrow kind of point here? Right? Is it the case that police departments anticipate crimes or do crime waves kind of drive police departments to take other measures? Right? That's a very important simultaneity question that we have to entertain. There's also certain other, other sorts of omitted variables that we might want to be able to account for aspects of policing quality. Uh, things that we're going to kind of hold constant here, but are questions nonetheless that we have. So one way in which this has been done, uh, among many, uh, is kind of to look at the COPS program. I'll talk about the COPS program in a second, and kind of to leverage that as a kind of interesting policy experiment to be able to answer this key question that we have here. You know, what is the impact of kind of expanding the police force on homicide victimization and other outcomes that we care about? Another approach says, you know what? You know, maybe if you have two different kind of measures of police employment, you can kind of use that to extract some signal uh, about the true effect of police employment on your outcomes of interest. And this is kind of takes the, you know, the, the form of this measurement error correction model uh, that my colleague Aaron Chalfin and Justin McCrary uh, kind of put forth in a very nice 2018 paper. Uh, but that's another approach that we're going to take. I'll only focus on the former kind of empirical strategy today for the sake of time. But uh, both of the kind of results speak you know, to one another in very consistent ways, both statistically and in terms of their mag economic meaning. So just to kind of give just a little bit of a background on the, on the COPS program, uh, it was kind of funded, it started under the Violent Crime Control uh, Act of 1994, something that many of my students are kind of amazed to hear because they kind of hear many different things about the 1994 crime bill, but many of them didn't realize that this was kind of a big part of it. Um, obviously, you know, one of the goals was to kind of distribute these block grants to local police departments throughout the country, usually about three years or so. And, you know, a big part of, you know, this kind of program is the kind of, you know, kind of giving out of kind of hiring grants more so uh, than anything else, which account for about half of the grant funding. Uh, but there's also the non-hiring grants as well that are kind of used uh, by police department applicants that eventually kind of take that money and invest it in technology and other sorts of things uh, that might be used in terms of improving public safety. So the grants themselves are reviewed and awarded based on fiscal need, application narratives, and other sorts of funding constraints. Uh, you know, local crime conditions is kind of one smaller part of that, but is a part of it nonetheless. And departments are required to kind of use the grants to hire police officers, and each grant is going to specify a certain number of eligible hires. And so that's going to be kind of one of the key kind of features that we'll use here. Uh, with the average grant in our sample being for about $21 million for about 143 officers, uh, we see about, about a 2.5 increase in police employment. So the COPS program, as has been shown uh, through other papers, uh, seems to have a very meaningful effect in terms of expanding uh, police forces throughout the country. So this is the last of the set of equations I'll show you, just to you know, be honest uh, to that point. Uh, but essentially what we want to do here is that for anybody who's familiar, we'll kind of run an instrumental variable strategy. So essentially we want to kind of refine our attention to a specific type of expansion in police forces you know, throughout the country, at least throughout our data. And in this case, instead of just kind of looking at the kind of you know, association between, say, the expansion of, the, of a police department a year ago and our outcome, say, homicide victimization, in this case, we're going to refine our attention to expansion that's attributable to being awarded a grant, right? So a key kind of thing that we ultimately do here, and then one a key assumption that's going to be here, that conditional on applying for the grant, that the number of eligible officers do not depend on local changes in crime. And that's kind of the, kind of the very kind of important identifying assumption that we're going to employ. And in doing so, uh, you know, I think we're fairly consistent with other kind of, you know, uh, you know, kind of beliefs about the viability of this approach within the literature. The other thing that I'll kind of note here is that we're also going to include some controls as has been shown by my colleague Emily Weisburs uh, for the size of the non-hiring grants and also uh, whether or not there are applications for hiring or non-hiring grants in a given year. And doing that allows for us at least to tackle some of the questions that people might have about the embracement of technology or willingness to embrace technology or other things of policing quality that we might care about. So this is going to kind of constitute the strategy that I'll talk about most today. Uh, but again, you know, whether it's this strategy or the measurement error correction strategy, uh, we have results that are very, very consistent with one another. In terms of the data, uh, we're going to be pretty much working with, you know, mostly publicly available sort of resources. And so in this case, uh, our attention is going to be dedicated exclusively to very large or large U.S. cities throughout the country, uh, about, you know, cities with about 50,000 residents uh, in 1980. And again, we're going to focus, at least for the COPS estimates, on the 1990 to 2018 period, but for the you know, other estimates, we'll kind of go back to 1980 or so. So we'll pull some police employment data from the US Census Annual Survey of Government, but also uh, from the FBI law enforcement officers killed and assaulted data, or the LIOCA data. Uh, and both of those data sets are going to provide us with a point in time measure of police employment, one provided by police departments themselves, the other kind of by a municipal uh, representative. 
finally, we'll also kind of pull in some information uh, on DOJ grant, uh, COPS grants applications. Uh, then we kind of, you know, mess with the, or we kind of use different kind of ways of uh, kind of uh, structuring the award funding in terms of the analysis that we're doing, but all of them kind of speak in the same way to the, result, the same results. In terms of homicide victimization and enforcement activity, we'll use some of the FBI data. And so in this case, we're going to be pulling from the supplementary homicide report, uh, which is an incident, a homicide incident level data set in which they kind of provide information both on the suspect, if there, if there is one that's known, uh, and the victims. Uh, one of the key things about these data is that we're able to kind of aggregate up to the city level and be able to kind of use uh, this information for uh, understanding racial disparities in homicide. We're also going to pull some FBI data the, from the Uniform Crime Report. So it's going to allow for us to pull in some of the arrest data that we're interested in. Uh, with the arrest data, unfortunately, we can only focus on this from the race point of view, not just race and, not race and ethnicity. So uh, these will be black versus white arrests as opposed to non-Hispanic black and white arrests. Finally, we're also going to include some demographic and municipal spending data uh, coming from the U.S. Census on the former front, and then uh, on the latter, the annual survey of governments, local government finances. So what am I going to kind of focus on today? I'm going to focus on the COPS estimates. Uh, for the sake of time, you know, I'll just kind of, you know, just kind of briefly kind of go into some of the key results that I think are important to kind of understanding our paper. Uh, the results themselves are weighted by population in 1980. Uh, we've tried, again, alternative estimation strategies, and they provide similar results. Uh, we provide also robust first stage evidence, uh, whether it be the measurement error correction model uh, or, it, or the kind of COPS models that we're kind of putting forth. Uh, and as I mentioned before, you know, we can see kind of meaningful changes in police employment uh, no matter what. But we don't see much evidence on the clearance rate. So that's kind of an interesting thing to think about I'll come back to uh, at some point during the talk. So I'm going to show you some point estimates. And when showing you the point estimates, which, how should we kind of interpret them? Uh, we should think about an additional cop leads to beta more or fewer outcomes, so whether it be homicides or arrests, uh, as we look at this with, for each, with respect to each racial group. We're also going to look at this in per capita terms, right, because as I mentioned before, you know, there are certain kind of population differences between representation for black and white Americans. Uh, and so in doing so, in this case, the estimate is going to say what, the, what is the kind of impact of one additional cop on beta more or fewer outcomes per 100,000 residents. Finally, uh, we also are going to want to test whether or not those differences across racial groups are statistically distinct. And so in doing so, we'll also kind of provide the p-values for you there. So uh, we'll, you know, I think we, you know, with this, we kind of have a kind of interesting set of results that we'll kind of go into now. So the first two questions are just going to be, well, kind of what is the impact of kind of hiring one additional officer on homicide victimization, kind of race-specific homicide victimization, and then also kind of index crimes? And so with index crimes, we have to focus on the kind of overall changes in index crime, but because we don't have race specific information for them. Uh, but we're going to do that in order to, we're going to do the latter in order to provide a benchmark uh, for kind of our index arrest estimates that I'll show you shortly afterwards. So let's kind of take just a quick look here. So one thing that I'm going to show you here is that you're going to have obviously homicides that we're going to focus on within these first couple of rows. Uh, here you'll have this row is going to correspond to kind of all victims. Uh, black victims and then white victims, and then of course we'll show you the p-value for whether or not there is some sort of statistical difference between those estimates. We'll also do the same thing. We'll kind of look at the index crime effects, and in this case, uh, you'll just kind of, you know, again, we won't look at this from a race point of view, but this is going to be important for the, the estimates that I'll show you on index arrest. You'll have the coefficient that's going to be presented here. Uh, we'll show standard errors, and then these are the per capita estimates that I mentioned before. Uh, their corresponding standard errors, the mean, and then number of observations. And again, we'll kind of show the p-values for those respective estimates. So what do we end up finding? Well, it seems as if the marginal officer kind of abates the same number of, well, approximately the, statistically the same number of homicides uh, for both black and white victims. Uh, but what's interesting is that when you look at this in per capita terms, uh, this seems to suggest that in terms of the gains to black Americans, they're about twice as large. So here we can see in per capita terms, the estimate is about 0 0.012, or negative 0 0.012 for black Americans and about 0 .00, negative 0 0.008 for white Americans. And these estimates are statistically different from one another. Um, what does this mean in terms of our results? Well, our kind of overall results suggest that if you want to abate one homicide, you need to hire approximately 10 to 17 officers depending on which set of estimates that we show you, right? In terms of the per capita estimates, as I mentioned before, they're about twice as large uh, for black victims relative to white victims. Uh, what's also interesting here, though, is that the marginal officer seems to be abating about 24 index crimes. And again, this result, each of these results are statistically significant at conventional level. So 
this kind of paints an overall picture that tells us that the, at least expanding the police force within our sample, within our sample period, is kind of associated with kind of an, an improvement in public safety when we at least look at uh, homicide victimization and also uh, index offenses. Next, we want to kind of turn our attention to enforcement activity. And so in terms of enforcement activity, uh, we're again going to focus on those two types of arrests that I mentioned before. Uh, we'll focus first on the quality of life arrests, and then we'll also kind of take a look at the index arrests. Uh, I'll kind of summarize some of the kind of overall results here, but show you some of the kind of heterogeneity that exists in terms of, you know, when we, what happens when we kind of look, break out some of these categories. Can we learn anything important uh, from kind of saying, hey, you know, what happens if we just kind of look at robbery versus some other sort of index offense? Or what happens if we focus on liquor law violations versus some other offense? And so uh, let me just kind of recap some of the kind of general findings. So uh, in terms of just, you know, for all, all Americans, so to speak, uh, the marginal officer seems to make one to two uh, fewer index arrests on average. Uh, so that's interesting because of the mere fact that, well, I just showed you a slide ago that suggested that the marginal officer seems to uh, abate about 24 index crimes. So they're reducing crimes, index crimes, but they're also making fewer arrests on average. Uh, that tells us perhaps that maybe a deterrent story uh, is at play here in which officers through their presence uh, might be able to kind of prevent some sort of crime rather than just simply through incapacitation. And turning to the reduction in arrest, one other thing I'll just say, the reduction in index arrest is about four to six times greater for black Americans. So uh, that's something else that's kind of important just because, well, we often associate these offenses with lengthy prison sentences. And so to the extent that we're able to reduce both crime and arrest for these offenses, uh, especially when it comes to historically disadvantaged groups, uh, this is something that you know, we can kind of you know, see as maybe a positive finding, if you will. So now, with that being said, for the marginal officer, they make approximately seven to 22 uh, additional uh, quality of life arrests. So in this case, it seems to be telling a different story uh, when we kind of focus on these more discretionary arrests. And there seem to be significant disparities when we focus on liquor law violations and drug possession uh, arrests. And so you know, I was trying to show you some of the heterogeneity in just a second, but one thing to note is that these, you know, when you focus on these categories alone, uh, it seems as if that, you know, officers make about 2.5 to 3 times as many of these arrests for black Americans and white Americans. You could think about that as, you know, maybe there might be a discrimination story or a bias story that's at play. Uh, we can't necessarily speak to that through our results. Uh, but because there's also the possibility uh, that maybe there might be differences in demand for this sort of policing uh, and also offending behavior that we're just not simply able to disentangle through the type of study design that we're using here. So in order to kind of show some of that heter heterogeneity I mentioned before, in this slide what I'm going to do is I'm going to break it out by different categories of quality of life and index arrests. And so on the panel A, what you're going to see here is going to be the quality of life arrest, and we'll kind of show you a dotted whisker plot uh, for each of these categories. We have disorderly conduct, uh, suspicious persons, curfew and loitering, all the way down uh, to drug possession. And then similarly, in panel B, we'll kind of have the index arrest, where we look at things like murder and manslaughter, rape, robbery, aggravated assault, uh, all the way down to motor vehicle theft. So in starting with the left-hand side, as I mentioned before, as you can see, there's not much going on, at least what we're, we're able to find in terms of some of these other categories in terms of drunkenness, gambling, uh, vandalism, but we are able to kind of see some effects uh, that, again, are statistically distinct across the racial groups uh, for liquor law viola violations and drug possession. So that kind of gives us some sense that, yeah, I mean, these are very discretionary offenses uh, that we want to make sure that we're able to properly account for uh, when we're kind of looking at, you know, how exactly police force expansions play out uh, within the enforcement realm. Turning to the index arrest, on the other hand, in this case, now we're going to take a look at things like robbery, where you can see that there's clearly an effect, and this reduction robbery arrest is declining to a great deal, and in fact, about maybe three or so uh, for the marginal officer, fewer. Uh, and you know, also, you can see this for burglary, theft, and motor vehicle theft. So it seems as if, comparable to some of the other literature that I discussed before, that some of these kind of you know, property or theft-related crimes uh, also seem to be uh, declining, or at least the arrest for them seem to be declining in ways in which it might be consistent with a deterrent story. So I think one of the kind of key things about this study is that we're able to kind of provide some kind of novel insight about how the benefits and costs might look like when we kind of account for race as an important factor. However, we also kind of want to acknowledge uh, that there seems to be a very kind of contentious debate uh, that exists you know, about how exactly it is to play out throughout America, but especially in black and say, brown communities. And so, uh, one question that's kind of, you know, kind of existed out there when you kind of think about, you know, kind of, you know, just not simply expansions in the size of the police force is like, 
how important are programs such as Stop, Question, and Frisk, right? You know, how viable are they to public safety? It seems as if, you know, uh, through the work of Gelman, Fagan, and Kiss, uh, that there are important disparities that exist, even if you account for, uh, you know, precinct level differences in crime rates. Uh, but one thing that's also interesting is the fact that, well, after the Floyd ruling that kind of ended Stop, Question, and Frisk as we previously knew it, and led to a, a very sharp decline around that period in stop question and first behavior, or in stop, Terry stops, I should say, uh, it does seem as if you no longer kind of see some of those same racial disparities. And so that tells us that maybe a lot of the policing that was taking place uh, under the previous stop question and first regime, regime might have been inefficient. There's also other questions. So, I mean, in terms of thinking about the motivations of police departments, uh, one thing that I like to point to is kind of the nice DOJ report as it corresponded uh, to uh, Ferguson, Missouri, in which they found that it seemed as if many uh, of the, the individuals within, the law, within law enforcement in Ferguson were kind of using this as a kind of as a revenue building thing, right? And so uh, that's, again, something that's not consistent with improving public safety, and it probably should not be uh, kind of a part of you know, what it is that we think is kind of important sorts of policing that we need to be pursuing. Uh, but I also kind of will mention the fact that, you know, racial bias has been something that's, you know, been increasingly kind of studied across a number of different, uh, you know, kind of methods and also disciplines. And I, I think this uh, paper from Goncalo Zamello is like one of my favorite papers. I'm glad he's here, but um, I can fan out now a little bit. But, um, you know, I do think that they have some very important things to say about the extent to which leniency and other things can be important and how we kind of view and measure the presence of racial bias in many of the interactions that we're kind of interested in understanding here. So, the other thing I kind of will kind of mention is the fact that, well, you know, every, you know, time an officer comes into contact with a civilian, there is an opportunity for a use of force event. And, you know, one of the nice estimates that came out of uh, my co one of my co-authors uh, previous papers is the fact that about 2.5% of arrests lead to some sort of police use of force incident. Uh, if you kind of think about the amount of, you know, police expansion necessary to abate one homicide, uh, that's going to imply that maybe we can expect about 7 to 10 use of force incidents of which about four to five incidents will involve a black civilian. So again, this is kind of just kind of back of the envelope calculations and, and kind of understanding how important, uh, you know, these sorts of kind of strategies are in terms of in, in increasing the size of the police force or otherwise, uh, because these are costs that while we don't account for in our study are costs that we want to consider nonetheless. So just to kind of leave you just with, with a couple of things to think about before we kind of go into Q&A. Uh, one of the things that pops up, I've sat in a number of different sort of kind of, of, uh, kind of workshops and conferences uh, looking to kind of understand how we can pursue uh, more efficient and fair uh, criminal justice policies. And one of the things that always comes up is the idea of redefining or reimagining policing. Well, a big part of kind of reimagining policing is understanding exactly what we're getting from this sort of uh, policing in the first place. And so I think our estimates kind of go a good bit of way of kind of building on the previous literature and giving us an understanding of exactly how important traditional policing, quote unquote, is uh, to this larger endeavor of kind of improving public safety, especially in black and brown communities. Uh, but there's also an important divergence uh, that seems to exist or a difference that exists uh, between some of the perceived community needs uh, that exist within many black and brown communities uh, historically and also the types of law enforcement practices that we ultimately receive uh, through our policy stakeholders. And so I always love to kind of point to two books that are favorites of mine, the Fortner, our Black Silent Majority book in 2015, uh, speaks about this from the perspective of Harlem, uh, while James Foreman Jr.'s uh, Pulitzer Prize winning work also uh, provides us with a nice kind of context within DC and kind of points to the fact that, hey, there are a lot of, you know, very, um, there's, I don't know if they still call it Chocolate City, but at one point DC was called Chocolate City. Uh, and with those many individuals that are kind of in, 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 in that sort of kind of uh, position, it's kind of odd to think about just the kind of severe differences in incarceration and other forms of crime that exist uh, within that area and the extent to which, you know, they believe that this public safety need is, is, is something that's important and viable. Uh, maybe we should listen to that a little bit. So I think that's, those are two books that I certainly would always recommend. Uh, but there's also a growing uh, kind of evidence on, or body of evidence on alternatives to traditional policing, so to speak. Um, these you know, things are very important because policing in itself is not a panacea for addressing public safety. It's just one important tool among many. And so whether it be officer diversity, youth summer employment, cognitive behavioral therapy, or even you know, kind of you know, providing additional green space or kind of removing the graffiti off of windows, uh, all these things are kind of shown to have some promise under very local conditions. However, I always like to add the caveat that we don't necessarily know exactly how some of these things might scale up, number one. So when we kind of use this 
as a very prominent feature in our public, you know, public safety improvement strategy, uh, you know, how will it fare is a very important question that I think you know, we're still kind of short on evidence with. Uh, the other thing is that it's going to be kind of a very important and radical uh, kind of transformation of kind of public safety and ways in which it can matter monetarily, but also in terms of the types of things that we might or might not be asking police forces to do or what we might be asking for other agencies to do. And so these are questions that I think we should do in consultation uh, with community members in all vested interests. So uh, that's kind of all the kind of the remarks that I have for you today, but uh, thank you for your time. I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Hey, thanks so much, Morgan. Uh, that was fantastic. I, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna ask one quick question and then uh, turn it over to to our audience, which is, um, there's a lot going on in these findings, um, and, and they've received quite a bit of, of public attention. Uh, likewise, some of the other work that you've cited, uh, like, like Jim Foreman Jr.'s book or Mike Fortner's book. Um, but it seems to me that every time that happens, there are both misunderstandings of the complexity of the findings, um, particularly in this issue space, and in some area, and in some cases, misuse. Yeah. And I'm wondering if, in the case of your own research, there are misunderstandings of the findings or, or, or misuse of them um, in ways that you'd sort of like to correct the record. Oh, well. <laughs> the public discussion, at least. Well, I mean, you know, um, I am no sheriff of the public discourse, so I won't necessarily uh, feel a need to necessarily correct it, right? We're researchers, we're trying to perform the most positive analysis, not normative, uh, as we can. And so in that way, uh, I think in many instances, no matter where you are on the ideological spectrum, people have a tendency to cherry pick work, right? So uh, if you are a very kind of pro, you know, blue lives matter, you know, policing is, you know, something that needs to be and, and is the end of the discussion. Um, well, I mean, we certainly don't say that, right? I mean, we kind of, kind of identify ways that policing can be important to public safety. Um, but in terms of the cost element too, I mean, I, I think it also, you know, kind of flips the other way, right? And so there are many people that kind of look at this and say, well, you know, look at the quality of life arrest results. And, you know, it just kind of proves or shows you that discrimination is play. Well, first of all, we don't really study discrimination within the paper. We don't at all. Uh, but also that's just kind of one slice of the puzzle. So uh, as a researcher, you know, I, I don't necessarily know if I have a, a need to kind of correct the public rector, record, so to speak, because I think that's, that's the unimaginable task for anybody that does research, right? But I do feel as if uh, a healthy understanding of the literature, I try to certainly do so uh, through my own work, uh, as a, you know, both as a researcher and as a professor, uh, and kind of showing students how to kind of, and others, quite frankly, kind of how to kind of navigate this work and come to very sensible evidence-based conclusions because that's what we're after at the end of the day. I always mention to people, no matter where you are in a perspective, many of us that are probably sitting in this room uh, don't necessarily bear the full cost of getting this wrong, right? There are many people uh, that are sitting in communities that don't look like this and they do not have the luxury of kind of getting, you know, well saying, well, we want to remove all of the police officers and putting in uh, a new sort of kind of alternative to policing without necessarily having the right sort of evidence, you know, to, in order to support that because they have to continue to send their kids to school, their grandmother has to continue to go to church under conditions in which we just can simply do not, you know, have to face. So there's that aspect of it too, but in the same, in the same vein, uh, you also have, you know, the problem of, you know, the policing that we would like to have that actually leads to benefits in public safety might not always, you know, kind of, you know, kind of be aligned with the things that we get, right? So I kind of cited the DOJ report uh, as one example of that in Ferguson, Missouri. There are countless others uh, beyond being able to enumerate. But I think the most important thing to say here is that, you know, we try to do very, you know, kind of relevant and kind of uh, accessible research. Uh, and to the extent that and it helps to inform good policy, that's great. Uh, to the extent that we can have productive dialogue, that's better. Uh, however, you know, it's kind of a, a very a big bear to tackle uh, when you're thinking about the extent to which uh, your research is kind of, you know, pulled in different directions. I, th I think on that, we'll just open it up to, to the audience. And uh, if there are a few student questions, we'll start with those. And happy to move to my esteemed uh, colleagues in the social sciences as well. Uh, yeah, we'll start Riley uh, in the back <coughs> and, then, and then move our way forward. Yeah, you, Riley. Sharing your, oh, <laughs> and for sharing your very interesting research. Um, I am wondering if in the data that you collected, you had the opportunity to look into how the 
police departments that you studied were growing, by which I mean, uh, did they tend to grow proportional to the size of the existing departments within the police, or did they all add 25 beat cops who increased visibility and uh, enforced quality of life crimes that way? Well, I, I think the, the most informative thing I can say is probably on the latter question, right? In the sense that uh, you know it's you know it's one of those things where policing is a bit of a black box, right? I mean, data you know quality is slowly, slowly, uh, you know, but it, you know it seems to be improving or going in the direct the right direction. So uh, you know, while we're able to answer you know questions like this, especially when focusing on kind of larger jurisdictions who we believe kind of have more consistent reporting. Uh, there's still a number of other things that we just simply don't know, right? We don't know necessarily how the police are necessarily, you know, kind of reallocating those new officers. You could make your own guesses, right? And, and with cops, I mean, you know, you're imagining more rookie classes or say, you know, coming again to the police department while if you're looking at, say, our measurement error, you know, estimates. And, and those estimates, they, it could be a combination of many different things. It could be, you know, additional officers do things like cops or just simple hiring or uh, it could be officers retiring too. So. I mean, there's a lot of different things that happen uh, that we're just not able to account for. Uh, but you know, this is you know still an important step, right? We want to be able to account for exactly what they are doing, uh, given our public investment in these agencies. Yeah, uh, I guess I'll wait for the microphone, as Joanne would uh, encourage me to remember. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Thanks for presenting your research, Professor. Um, I was wondering, just because I had, I actually had the opportunity to read your paper for my class with Professor Kumar. <laughs> um, there's a, a point uh, in which you note, uh, and your fellow researchers note, um, that in cities with large black populations, um, the returns to these investments, investments which you were discussing, um, like the reduction in index crime arrests, actually like don't decrease while there is still a greater number of quality of life arrests, which you know, is associated with those problems of police uh, interactions you know, leading to uh, use of force. Uh, but I was wondering if there's also, in, in these types of cities, um, we don't observe the, uh, the benefit of a decrease in homicides um, in general or, or for their black populations. Oh, it's a good question. It's actually something that we kind of entertain within the NBR working paper version uh, of the paper, right? Uh, we they won't make it into the AR insights, the, the published version, but uh, you know, part of that is just you know, uh, you know, kind of editorial differences, if you will. So you know, one of the things I will say is that you know, it's kind of an interesting kind of political economy question, right? We kind of broke it out across the distribution in terms of cities represent, you know, how much of the you know city is percent, you know, percent, you know, what percentage of the city is black. And there seems to be some important differences when you kind of look at predominant, very black cities, so to speak, or you know, represented black cities versus cities with kind of smaller black shares, right? In terms of the sorts of benefits that we're seeing, uh, you know, in some places you're seeing exactly what it is that we kind of tell within this particular story here uh, in the more aggregated setting. However, in others, you know, where you kind of have these kind of larger percent black populations, um, you don't necessarily you see the sticks but not the carrots, right? And so. Uh, and that's, you know, that we found that to be kind of an interesting finding to kind of build off of. And again, I think it's more so kind of an interesting political economy question that we can't necessarily answer uh, specifically with the machinery that we're using here. Uh, but it is the one that I think we can kind of build on in the future because, well, you know, there are some important differences as we kind of move about the country, not just uh, across, you know, uh, different kind of racial groups within cities, but uh, across, you know, uh, you know, ideological lines or whatever it may be you're entertaining. Uh, that requires us to answer these very questions about how these resources are being allocated. So uh, while we can't necessarily say a great deal uh, about, you know, say, hey, what happens if we take that money and give it to another agency, uh, at least from the historical perspective, it, you know, in, in a cost benefit, in a very narrow cost benefit way, uh, it does seem as if that policing does seem to kind of uh, be, you know, beneficial. Again, very narrow consideration. Other questions? Uh, Dil Dylan, then Jason. Sorry, Jason. <laughs> Students first. Um, <laughs> so I'm wondering, um, obviously, with the shooting in Uvalde, uh, where you had at least four different types of police agencies, you had Border Patrol, you had state police, local police, federal marshals there. Um, 
it seems to me like the data that you're presenting uh, is generalizable and that um, you need, you said 10 to 17 police officers for every one homicide or something like that to stave off. And so I'm wondering um, if you're doing a cost benefit analysis of that uh, with 10 to 17 police officers throughout their entire tenure on the police force and then pensions and stuff like that versus hiring social services and alternatives like that, um, is that, um, is that really worth it? And then when you speak of kind of policing in general as kind of reducing crime, when you see instances like that in Uvalde where there was a lot of inaction that parents are now blaming police for the loss of their children, um, kind of is there the social ability to really argue that now when these big events occur and people kind of have these passions inflamed where they see inaction and an argument saying 10 to 17 police officers for every one homicide honestly doesn't seem that convincing. Well, I mean, it's certainly a fair question, right? You know, and, you know, it's certainly something that we want to ask in any circumstance, you know, whether it be tragic or the many kind of deaths that take place every day. Um, there are many children, you know, I mean, you know, homicide tends to be skewed towards younger populations. So there are many children that are dying every day from homicide. Uh, many of them with, you know, black and brown faces attached to, attached to them. So it's rightful to ask, you know, whether or not these things are actually working. And again, I think, you know, one of the things I want to kind of, you know, state is that the p police are not a panacea, right? They're not going to solve everything. They're not omnipresent. And, you know, there are certain things that they might be able to do. And there's certain things they might not be in, a be in the best position to do. Uh, it's one thing to kind of talk about kind of, you know, the kind of average impact of hiring additional officer within our city of large, uh, within our sample of large cities uh, over a very specific time period uh, on, you know, s you know, general civilian homicides. It's another to ask, you know, you know, what happens when we expand the police force? Does it do a great deal in terms of, you know, reducing the probability of a mass shooting? The circumstances which tend to differ as we move from one shooting to the next. Uh, and also, you know, it's a viable question about, you know, what exactly was happening, right? I'm not as privy to all of the exact details given that it just happened. Um, and so I can't really kind of say, you know, how policing should or should not be able to improve that particular situation. I understand the frustrations as well. Um, I've been on, you know, and on the opposite side and on the good side of, of, of policing, so to speak. So I can certainly kind of understand why uh, people might be frustrated in the first place. Um, but in terms of like kind of, you know, exactly how they would have prevented that, I don't think our kind of, you know, study could speak to that necessarily. In terms of the cost benefit analysis, now, that's something that we kind of do as form, as, as, form, as a form of kind of back of the envelope calculation. Uh, the extent to which, you know, we're able to kind of alter, you know, entertain alternatives to policing and how exactly they would or would not necessarily be as cost beneficial, something that we can't kind of really address as well, right? Because that's a counterfactual that we just do not have access to. Um, and also, we do not know how some of these things will scale up. So while it is important that we kind of entertain how it is, how possible it is for many of these agencies to kind of fill in some of the gaps in policing or, or perhaps to even do a better job, um, it, you know, we should kind of cautiously kind of, you know, kind of evaluate the evidence just like we would do anything else uh, and see whether or not those agencies can also kind of bear important fruit. Because again, the people that are on the kind of the losing or gaining side of this typically do not, you know, kind of exist in the type of spaces that we're sitting in right now. Jason. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, so the the paper is very interesting, and in it. And in the, throughout the entire presentation, you have two main categories, right? Index arrests and the quality of life. And if you go back to 1994, this is a very interesting moment in time. We think of criminal justice issues being very important now, but that was also a time of peak, you know, the contract of America. You have rising support for capital punishment, you know, very intense period at, at that moment in time. So my question is, is would the policymakers be happy with this particular program? You presented, it, it, it's, it's hard for me to, break this down, you have fewer index arrests, but you have more quality of life arrests. Mm -hmm. If I'm thinking of why they're doing the program, they're pr probably focused on the index arrests, um, and those seem to be going down, which you could tell is a good thing, maybe a deterrence story, but maybe it's a bad thing if they're interested in punitive, I don't know. Uh, so I guess I, I'm, I'm asking you to compare what do we get from the from this policy? What, what, were they, was it designed to, uh, work on one of those two outcomes, categories, and do you think, I don't know, is it, are they equal or is it asymmetric? 
Well, I mean, in, in terms of a comparison, I, I'm, I'm, I think that's kind of difficult, right? A lot of things, you know, I was kind of talking about this with, with Charlie's class earlier, is that we really do not know the kind of objective functions for police departments themselves, right? So, you know, are they kind of in it to kind of just, you know, with a, are they kind of going into it with a kind of a very narrow focus on reducing the most serious of crimes? Uh, or they kind of pursuing order maintenance strategies, right? I mean, this is something uh, that can be seen, you know, just from like looking at cities like New York versus LA versus other places uh, that pursue these different policies to different degrees. Um, and so maybe their kind of, you know, kind of objective function just looks a little bit different. Um, in terms of the kind of period, I think you're exactly right uh, in the sense that, you know, it, it's kind of hard, you know, for people, even as, you know, things are not necessarily in the best of shape now in terms of how we think about rising gun violence. Uh, you know, it was much worse uh, for anybody that's old enough to remember, uh, kind of going back into the early 1990s. Uh, the difference being, you know, between those two periods is, is it has a large part to do with gun proliferation. And so, uh, you know, we see a lot of the kind of gun violence that took place in the early 1990s, while there, you know, it was kind of, it was much higher uh, in most places than what it is today, even though not all. St. Louis is certainly the exception to that. Uh, you know, and, you know, it's, you know, what's kind of fueling that, you know, the homicides, you know, at least what, you know, people tend to think in the literature is going to be more so like the crack cocaine related, drug related kind of violence that comes from having markets that are kind of completely unregulated and having no ways of sort selling disputes. Um, versus now where gun proliferation is just so high and now you're starting to see gun, ghost guns becoming more prevalent as well, that uh, it just makes it a bit of a different sort of public safety challenge. Uh, that we're facing in over the past five years or so than what we saw in the 90s and before then. So um, I think in terms of kind of understanding exactly, it, are policymakers getting exactly what they want? It's kind of hard to say in, you know, in, in any definitive terms. Um, there's also just the idea that perhaps the marginal offender in 1993 just looks a bit different than what they do today as well, just given that we kind of, at least, you know, we thought we were in some sort of kind of low crime equilibrium. So. Um, I, I think that the, the question is certainly an important one. Again, I, I think comparing, comparing the kind of index, I think that's obviously something that was on many of the policy makers' minds at the time and now. Comparing index of rest of quality life arrest is just apples to oranges in, in many ways. Some of it's used in, the, in servicing uh, the idea of addressing more serious crime. And then some of it also just might be demand from you know, local communities, you know, maybe you know, you know, local you know, the older you know, people in the building want to see fewer people just being as rowdy out front because they believe it kind of leads to some sort of kind of violence that they would like to avoid. Uh, there's also the idea that maybe you know, cops are just discriminating in, in, against black Americans in ways in which is you know, kind of driving uh, you know, some of the disparities that we see when you expand the size of the police force. So uh, all those things are kind of important kind of, you know, considerations, but uh, I do think it, it is a worth, worth, you know, is a worthy exercise to be able to ask, you know, uh, are we getting the biggest bang for the buck in, in, in policy terms? And I think that one way of just saying is that we seem to be getting some important returns and other things we need to kind of go back and see if we can refine exactly how we're pursuing policing throughout the country. Yeah, well, this, sorry, one, one question I had uh, reading your paper was, you know, if you think back to the old days, like broken windows policing was this theory that if we really crack down on low level offenses, that's going to be where we get deterrence of higher level offenses, mm -hmm. right? And so your paper it could be seen as consistent with that theory, right? Where these like low level, you see a large increase in offense in arrests for low level crimes. So were you guys able to say any, are you able to say anything about like, are those arrests important for producing like the serious crime declines or do they seem kind of unnecessary? Yeah, I mean, in terms of how efficient those arrests are, we, we really can't say. I, I think we kind of will turn to some of the kind of growing literature uh, that seems to be coming from elsewhere. Uh, obviously one of my co-authors, Emily and Felipe and others have kind of shown uh, that, you know, when officers are killed in the line of duty, uh, there does seem to be an important decline uh, in the types of enforcement activity that, you know, we, we think is pretty standard. Uh, but that decline in enforcement activity doesn't necessarily sacrifice uh, public safety, right? And so it could be that many of the quality of life arrests that we're seeing within our data uh, are consistent with the idea that some of those arrests are indeed inefficient. Um, it also kind of, you know, builds on the, the point I made earlier with, uh, you know, the Gelman, Vegas, and Fagan and Kiss paper with all the, you know, the, the, the you, know, you, know, you know, stops that were taking place in predominantly black and brown communities in New York City. Uh, 
Uh, it does seem as if after the Floyd ruling uh, that we were able to, one, maintain you know, kind of a low crime uh, scenario throughout the city, uh, relatively speaking. Uh, but two, the racial disparities seem to have gone away, right? So if that's, you know, those two things are happening, then maybe uh, in many of those stops that police officers were making in New York City just were not efficient stops, which could also be seen uh, through like, you know, contraband recovery and other things that the literature seems to have pointed to. Well, Ellen, did you have a question as well? How does the data enable you to identify which American cities seem to be did your examination of the data enable, to, enable you to identify which American cities seem to be doing a good job of reducing crime through hiring police without increasing racial disparities, without increasing misery for black residents? Uh, well, I mean, to kind of go back to the cherry picking point, I, I imagine there are many police departments that were making that very argument uh, you know, to their superior, so to speak. Um, but we, we can't really make such an argument on our, you know, we're kind of looking at the average experience, right, in, within our data. And in doing so, we can't necessarily say that, hey, you know, New York has been doing an awesome job, in Chicago you have work to do, or Philly you have work to do. Um, it's really kind of leveraging the collective experiences of each of these kind of large police departments and seeing how, according to the historical record, they seem to fare in terms of, you know, uh, improving, you know, homicide, you know, victimization numbers and, uh, you know, changes in how they kind of go about making arrests. So, uh, while we can't necessarily say exactly who it is and, you know, the results that were kind of, you know, uh, you know kept in the uh, working paper version of the paper, it gives us some sort of hint about it. But uh, I, I think that we're still a little ways away from doing that. And that's going to require, you know, kind of better data. I will point humbly to... So you'll come back in a year or two. <laughs> <laughs> if you have me, it's been, it's been <laughs> awesome. It's uh, just a beautiful, beautiful campus and even more beautiful people uh, with great things to to say uh, you know, about these sort of issues. So um, uh, what I will say is that I do have some co-authors you know, co or, you know, on, on a different project that have kind of looked at a similar question, right? Like you can't really kind of do much in terms of causality, but what happens if we kind of take the characteristics of the best departments and kind of allocate them to other departments? You know, what would happen in terms of, say, use of force events, which they tend to focus on? And it seemed as if in doing so, uh, you know, kind of giving, say, the characteristics of New York City uh, which seem to do a relatively decent job in terms of kind of disparities that we see in use of force uh, incidents. Uh, we gave those characteristics to Phoenix. Phoenix would be doing much better, but the converse is not true. So, I mean, there's a lot of great work that's coming together on these issues that are taking very, very serious or sophisticated approaches to answering these very important sorts of uh, you know, research and policy questions. And uh, hopefully, uh, we'll all kind of have a bit more to say in a year or two. And in that case, I would love to come back. I might ask a quick final question, taking the prerogative of this seat. Um, and this is stepping back a bit. So you described yourself as a scholar of race first and economics second. And, and it strikes many social scientists that um, leading journals in our field have long not focused on race as a variable of interest. And this strikes me as an interesting social science question with a number of plausible mechanisms to explain it. And I'm wondering which of those you find most plausible? Uh, well, I mean, I, I think that, you know, there, there are many reasons why you kind of think about this. I, at least from, you know, I still consider myself a card-carrying economist, but, um, you know, I think, you know, uh, at least from the narrow, you know, kind of, you know, uh, perspective of our discipline, uh, there's been a lot of ebbs and flows and in interest in, in kind of race-related research. So, uh, you have, you know, in the 70s, just, you know, a number of just phenomenal, you know, economists that have kind of come about and asked and, and kind of, you know, put forth concepts and ideas that stick with us to this day, right? I mean, even when you kind of look at the, I would, I would imagine if you were to sample the, you know, papers within the past year, past 10 years or so that have taken any sort of look at disparities uh, along racial lines, they're still kind of using taste-based and statistical discrimination, right? We've kind of branched out from that a little bit, but uh, those are still two staples that economists kind of refer to not the only forms of discrimination, but some forms of discrimination that communists refer to in trying to kind of understand, you know, why certain disparities in, say, criminal justice uh, outcomes might exist. Um, over time, those things, you know, kind of sort of change. Part of it could be the people that were brought into the profession, you know, just have kind of entered different parts, and other parts just that, you know, maybe we could just be doing a bit of a better job um, and kind of giving students and, you know, a good space to be able to ask, 
these very important questions, not just saying, hey, what happens if I add some sort of dummy variable for race into my regression, uh, we see disparities. I mean, we can go and do a bit better than that at this point, and we can ask questions about, you know, to what extent uh, do we believe discrimination is at play versus, you know, stereotypes or bias or, you know, you know, what are we able to kind of, you know, do if we kind of use, say, an algorithmic approach to making pretrial decisions versus kind of allowing for judges to kind of use uh, their own experiences, right? These are things that are coming up now uh, that I think will help kind of maybe prevent some of the ebbs and flows, I'm being optimistic here, uh, that we have tended to see from economics, but other disciplines as well. And uh, to me, that's a good thing. One, um, it's always kind of good to be in the company of great uh, race-related research. Uh, on the other hand, it will help to kind of inspire new questions, new ideas, new theoretical paradigms, and things that we can use uh, to kind of advance this research beyond uh, some of the things that we've been working for, working with over the past 40, 50, 60 years. So. Uh, I think, if anything, um, there's probably a number of different explanations for it, uh, but all of them probably have some sort of role. I blame the editors, too. <laughs> None of the editors, if there are any editors here, um, no, um, <laughs> you're great. Um, but, uh, no, but uh, no, in all seriousness, I mean, it's uh, something that we should kind of find ways to accommodate you know, within the academic setting, because I think they are fascinating questions, whether you're interested in race or interested in a specific aspect of your discipline. Uh, you know, introducing race can and kind of, you know, change some of the questions that you're entertaining and asking. And that's a, that can be a, a quite, you know, uh, rewarding intellectual experience. Please join me in thanking Professor Williams. Thanks so much. That was great. Thank you.